Now the first thing I'm removing are these two screws and these two screws hold the sump cover on. And what the sump cover does is it allows you access into the sump when you come to service but it also holds the flue manifold um, which connects the sump to the turret in position and you have to remove this cover when you want to remove the flue manifold. The next thing I'm removing is the condensate trap. Now this is one of the old traps and it has a retaining nut on the bottom here which I'm taking off which holds the condensate trap in position. In the new ones this doesn't exist now, it's just a, a plastic um, cover now which goes on which is moulded into the, the trap itself. Now I've removed the trap I can now um, start taking off this manifold. Now the sump is the Achilles heel for this make and boiler, it happens in all the ranges. Um, this is my opinion and I think because it's a downward burner um, the actual sump couldn't take the temperature so when we did take this sump cover off and um, we ended up putting it back on and we tightened the screws up we ended up um, cracking it because they always seem to crack in the same place. That's just my opinion on that. Now I'm just removing the fan and the fan's just held on with this one screw and the nut holding the gas pipe on. And this fan is constructed from a die cast alloy. There is an injector positioned at the bottom of the mixer tube. The outside di diameter of the um, injector allows for the correct amount of air gas mixture. The gas air mixture is under a negative pressure created by this fan. So there are two electrical connections. One is a 230 volts AC, which the fan motor electrics convert to 330 volts DC to drive the fan. So we need that energy to drive it. The other connection adjusts the speed of the fan between 1.5 to 2.7 volts DC. This connection is known as the pulse wide modulation connection, or the PWM. Um, the gas rate is increased and decreased depending on how fast the fan goes. Now this burner, I'm starting to take the burner off now. And the burner is manufactured from a ceramic fibre plaque and is fastened onto the heat exchanger by these four 8mm studs. Now the two at the front are a lot shorter than the ones at the back. So you can see I'm struggling to get the ones at the back off. Um, and this is why they make them a lot higher. Now this one is easier to get off than the one I'm trying to get off now. That is a pain. So this is probably the worst one. But you don't have to take these all the way off. You just need to slacken them to be able to um, remove the burner. Which you're going to find I'm going to struggle to do. Because it's a lot easier to take the burner off uh, when it's actually on the wall, believe it or not, than when it is laid down on its back like this. So while I'm struggling to get this burner out, um, I will be we will be seeing the heat exchanger. So the heat exchanger is constructed from cast aluminium alloy. The water enters via the return pipe connection on the right hand side of this uh, uh, heat exchanger and then splits into two waterway passages. Each passage travels up and down the heat exchanger nine times before again meeting on the flow outlet which is on the left hand side at the bottom of the heat exchanger. Now once I finally do remove this burner, at the top of the heat exchanger is the ignition electrode and the flame detection probe. Now the ignition electrode is uh, positioned at the top left hand corner of the combustion chamber and the spark gap should be between 2.5 and 4.5 millimeters. The flame detection probe is positioned in the middle of the combustion chamber and if you put a straight edge across the top of the burner it should be no more than 13.5 millimetres lower than this straight edge. So it should be between 11.5 and 13.5 millimetres. So as you've just seen I've just removed the gas valve and the gas valve has two solenoids that work in tandem. The voltage will peak at 240 volts DC. A typical multimeter will show a voltage reading of between 215 volts DC and 150 volts DC. This will indicate that the gas valve is working correctly at the PCB. So you can now see I'm removing these two retaining screws which hold the main heat exchanger to the body of the actual boiler. So there are two screws which hold in on this side and there are two hooks on the back of the heat exchanger which clip into the body of the boiler.
Now the next thing I'm going to remove is this, which is the uh, return thermistor. There's also a thermistor on the flow, and there's one at the top of the heat exchanger, which I call the hot water uh, thermistor, which is a no-flow thermistor, and it turns off the boiler at 105 degrees, so it's like a high limit stat. Now that was a, the retaining clip which I've just removed on the return pipe. I expect it to be one on the flow, but there actually isn't. So there's only one retaining clip. So I've just removed the retaining clip now for the diverter valve head. So the diverter valve is for heating the hot water. So when the pin inside this diverter valve is out, it's in central heating mode. And when the pin is in, it's in hot water mode. So basically, in this cartridge, which this is attached to, it's a spring-loaded cartridge, which you can just see here, um, the motor drives it in or lets it come back out to either go into hot water or central heating mode. So what happens is when you open the tap, the uh, flow turbine then sends power to the PCB. The PCB then uh, operates this diverter valve head and then turns it into heating or hot water, depending on whether the tap is running or not. It's as pretty straightforward as that. So I'm just removing this left-hand side hydro block. There's just a couple of screws holding the hydro block to the case. And then I should be able to move this flow pipe out of the way. And this full left-hand side hydro block should come out incredibly easy. So if you had to work on this cartridge, you would remove this full um, left-hand side hydro block to be able to get out all the components. But the plate-to-plate -plate heat exchanger is connected to this by just two allen screws so now i've got the allen key just done doing the first allen screw and i'm going to remove this plate to plate heat exchanger now this plate to plate heat exchanger is dead easy to remove it's just literally these two allen screws um, so four milli allen screws dead easy to remove so I'm just going to drop this down at the bottom of the boiler case and then I'm going to remove this left hand side hydro block so then I can, it makes it easier for me to take the plate to plate out then So what I'm doing now is I'm just undoing these um, securing screws to the right hand side hydro block where the pump is, um, the flow turbine and the low water pressure sensor and the pump. I'm going to take this all out as one complete unit which again is just a matter of undoing three screws and undoing the return pipe which goes to the bottom of the heat exchanger. Now I've undone this nut on top of the pump, I can now take the primary heat exchanger out. So it comes out as one complete unit. So first of all I'm just going to disconnect the flame rectification lead. So there's like a little plastic junction box there to allow me to disconnect it finally. And now I'm just taking off the wire going to the uh, no flow sensor on this top left hand side of the heat exchanger and now I'm just taking off the thermistor cable on the flow thermistor so that's all out now so literally I've got to take this pump out right hand side hydro block and the expansion vessel and then I should have completely stripped it so I'm just undoing this copper pipe going to the expansion vessel 
Now one thing to look out when you're changing the expansion vessels on these boilers, um, the actual connection off the pump is different on the newer versions than it is on the older ones. So as you can see on this one, it's still a copper pipe going up to feed the expansion vessel, but on this one it comes off the side of the pump where the newer ones come off the back of the pump. So you've just got to watch out that uh, you make sure you get the right expansion vessel. But the expansion vessels are the same, they're the same for the 24, 13, 35 kilowatts. There's no difference with these expansion vessels. And um, you will be pressurizing them to about uh, 0.75 to, to 1 bar. Um, so when you're checking them on the service, um, that's what pressure you should be checking in there, obviously with no pressure in the boiler. And it's literally just held on with these two screws. So one at the top, one at the bottom and a clip. And then it should just slide out. And that's how easy it is to uh, remove this expansion vessel. And so that is all the components taken out of this boiler.